Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Monday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. We have good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today. A big thanks to Greg Knapp for sitting in for me Thursday and Friday. Jim, I know it's a big week for you. A lot of rumors that Le'Veon Bell could end up with the Jets. So um, I, I know your attention is going to be challenged this week, but I'm confident you're up to the task. Huh? What? <laughs> No, this is the most important cracked bell since the Liberty one. Um, <laughs> you know, I was going to say, uh, as we are having this taping, so uh, the NFL has its illegal tampering where you're absolutely positively not supposed to talk about players. They're still under contract to another team. You know, uh, don't do that. Even though they'll say, well, so-and-so is a great player. He'd be an asset to any team. And while I can't talk about any player under contract, I don't know. He seems like he'd be worth $31 million over four years if he was interested, you know. <laughs> but now, as of our, the moment we are having this conversation, the deadline is best. Gentlemen, start your legal tampering engines. Deals cannot be finalized until uh, Wednesday. So. Big week for football fans all over the place, Jim. All right, let's move on to our good martini now. And a lot of times we talk about things that aren't going well for Democrats or uh, maybe we're excited about the the potential of a Republican candidate or a Republican office holder. And now we can actually talk about a Republican who got elected and is doing amazing things. We did this a lot with Scott Walker over his eight years in Madison. And while we're very early into the Ron DeSantis administration in Florida, Things are looking very, very good uh, so far. We talked early on in his administration about his excellent Supreme Court picks. He got to walk into office and make three picks, which is amazing. But uh, your colleague over at National Review, DeRoy Murdoch, has a bullet point list here of things that DeSantis has already done really in just two months on the job, which is amazing. There's the three Supreme Court uh, justices. Uh, He also is leading the way on Florida deregulation, trying to make it so that you don't have to go through onerous hundreds upon hundreds or maybe even a thousand hours of training to become a barber or a nail salon uh, specialist. And he's uh, so he's trying to deregulate that way. He got rid of Common Core. He accepted the resignations of the Broward County and uh, Palm Beach County election officials after completely botching their election results uh, in his election and in the and in the, in the Senate election, he got rid of Scott Israel. Uh, he also, uh, to the delight, I think, of people on both sides of the aisle, got rid of some uh, people on the South Florida Water Management District, uh, according to DeRoy Murdoch, to replace the entire uh, staff there with appointees not beholden to the heavily subsidized sugar industry, which was a notorious polluter in, in the region. So that was good. A lot of people like that. He's lowering taxes, not by a lot, mainly with uh, property tax cuts and some uh, tax holidays for back to school and before hurricane season and things like that. Uh, he convinced Trump to uh, extend more time for Florida cities and counties to seek uh, reimbursement for debris removal after the hurricane. And after all this and a whole lot more, that's just a thumbnail sketch of what he's done here. uh, His approval ratings up to 64 percent for a guy who barely won back in November. So, uh, Jim, turns out when you do what you say you're going to do, people reward you. Yeah. And I think there's a very important lesson in this, not just for, you know, uh, other Republican governors, but future future Republican governors, future Republican presidents. Uh, Republican mayors, you know, hit the ground running, jump in and try to get stuff done as much as you can. There's a reason we get hyped over a president's first 100 days. And you can argue about whether it's overdone. And yes, it's only a small fraction of the amount of time that you're in office. But uh, what happened, I think it was that old saying, you know, what's going to what's going to shape the course of history events, dear boy events. Um, you become governor, you, you end up in charge of a state and all of a sudden things happen hurricanes hit there's a natural disaster there's a man-made disaster there's controversy you know somebody in the state legislature has some terrible scandal budget numbers are different than you expected tax revenues come in differently than you expected there's a problem in the pension fund there's there's a million and one little things that are going to happen so i don't know if everybody realizes how much the natural course of events are going to shape a governorship are going to shape time of running a state um, and take away your ability to get th- things done that you had on your, you know, that long list of promises that got you into office. I think probably one of the best examples of this and one that I'm still kind of fuming about was the NRA and, and National Rifle Association and gun rights organizations were pretty darn pleased uh, when President Trump was elected. He didn't have the best record on, in past comments, but they looked at him and said, look, he's better than Hillary. 
this is a guy we can trust. This is a guy uh, who's going to go along with us. And again, I don't, other than comments in the Oval Office, it's not like Trump has gone out and done anything against uh, Second Amendment or, or gun owners or things like that. But one of the things the NRA wanted to see get done was concealed carry reciprocity. The idea, if you have a concealed carry permit in one state, it should be good in all states. The same way if you have a driver's license in one state, it should be good in all other states. You know, this is one of those things where I remember t- talking about this at the 2017 NRA convention in Atlanta. It's like, OK, you know, we got a friendly president. We got a friendly uh, majority in the Senate. We got a friendly majority in the House. Let's get chopping, guys. And there's a little bit of talk. No, no one really had a really good answer of why this wasn't one of the first things that was done coming out of the gate. Republicans in Congress were working on the tax cut bill, trying to repeal and replace Obamacare. The answer was one part. Oh, you know, there's only so many hours in a day. And two, maybe we'll keep that for 2018. This might be a good issue to do right before the midterms to fire up uh, gun owners and, and NRA members and stuff like that. Well, they didn't get it done. <laughs> Parkland happened. All of a sudden, the votes on Second Amendment and gun rights issues became a lot more controversial. It became, you know, you saw Rick Scott, a guy who we like on a lot of different issues, sign that gun proposal, taking away uh, uh, the right of 20, anyone under age 21 to own a firearm. And concealed carry reciprocity did not get passed. And it ended up, it, we're now we got to, you know, it's not going to get passed in this Democratic House. And so we don't know if forever, you know, when the next opportunity for that will come along. So strike when the iron is hot, get it done, because you just don't know what tomorrow is going to hold and whether you'll have the opportunity to pass that other item on your agenda. All right, let's move on to our bad martini now, Jim. And uh, on Friday, uh, the House passed what they call For the People Act. It's basically uh, changing the way money works in uh, elections. Uh, You could say that it's mainly a way to uh, curtail free speech. That's certainly how Mitch McConnell looks at it and why this bill will never reach a vote on the Senate floor. He's been very clear about that. Uh, Basically, it allows a lot of public financing for campaigns. They'll what do they give you six times in public money uh, as much as ever, any donation you actually get from private hands? A lot of problems with H.R. 1, but uh, there was an effort to attach some language to it that the Democrats shot down. Uh, let's go to Fox News. Nearly every House Democrat on Friday opposed a measure condemning voting in U.S. elections by illegal immigrants as part of a sweeping elections reform bill. The motion was voted down 228 to 197. All but six Democrats in the House voted against it. Just one Republican opposed it. Lauren Fine, a spokeswoman for House GOP Whip Steve Scalise, pointed out that an identical resolution was adopted by the House last September. But on Friday, 41 Democrats flipped to oppose the latest measure. Quote, these 41 Democrats must now answer to voters why they were against illegal immigrants voting in elections six months ago, but are suddenly in favor of it now, Fine said. Here's the language. Allowing illegal immigrants the right to vote devalues the franchise and diminishes the voting power of the United States citizen, unquote. Jim, such controversy. Um, You know, while you were out last week, Greg, other Greg and I, uh, that's my name for him, by the way, other Greg. (laughs) Um, I I didn't decide to go with good Greg and bad Greg. He's a pretty good Greg. But uh, the other Greg, we were talking about a proposal from a Democratic member of Congress to lower the voting age until 16, uh, when we had many snarky things to say about 17 year olds and what we were like when we were 17 and things like that. Just an observation, like when you when you see this argument, what what is the what is the advantage of citizenship? What what is the benefit of citizenship? I completely believe you should treat people who come here legally or illegally with humanity. Uh, they they have rights. It doesn't mean you can just you know beat them up or something like that. They have they have the same human rights as everybody else, but. Citizenship has to have some sort of advantage. It has to have some sort of privilege that non-citizenship doesn't get. And some of it would be, you know, uh, collecting U.S. benefits, um, the right to work in this country. Um, it, it can't just be, well, if you're a citizen, you have to pay taxes and the IRS will come on, come after you. If you're here illegally, you can uh, you get paid under the table. You don't have to worry about taxes. And I remember during one of the immigration proposals uh, debated in the late uh, in Bush's second term, was an argument about this. And one of the ideas was, OK, you know, it is unfair that people who've been living in this country illegally uh, haven't been paying taxes. Uh, and so one of the compromise proposals that was tossed around is that they had to pay for taxes on three of the last five years uh, before they could get full U.S. citizenship. And I remember sitting here thinking, how many years do U.S. citizens have to pay <laughs> their income taxes? They had to pay five out of five. Why, why, why were people who entered the country illegally getting this extra break? Ah, you know, we're, we're not going to enforce that law against you. We're going to give you a pass on that. 
um, there has to be an advantage to citizenship. And one of the, the, the really one lone advantage you have as a citizen is you get to vote. And I think we should protect that. I think we should treat that as, you know what? That's really special. We don't just hand it to everybody who just walks across the border. You have to, you know, and if you don't do this, if you somehow are, are using fraudulent papers or something like that, and you attempt to cast a ballot, we should throw the book at you. And it's very interesting to see this is considered a controversial statement in democratic circles these days. Yes, I get, I'm sure they, you know, they were grumbling and they saw it as, you know, a uh, stage manage or a symbolic vote or, or Republicans trying to put them on the spot. Well, guess what? Republicans put you on the spot and you guys decided, yeah, we're okay with illegals voting. <laughs> as, uh, not, or at the very least, we're not that upset about illegal immigrants voting. Well, to paraphrase my outstanding intern, uh, Christian, who produced the podcast while I was out last week. Uh, so do we care about foreign influence on federal elections or not? <laughs> Only the wrong kind of foreign. Look, some of us are old enough to remember when, you know, the Chinese were financing Bill Clinton's reelection campaign. <laughs> it's, it's the wrong evil empire. That was the right <laughs> evil empire that was influencing U.S. elections. All right, let's go on to our crazy martini now, Jim, and let's get to a new poll, a new Harris poll done exclusively for Axios, which shows what millennials and Gen Z are thinking about key political issues and political philosophy and how, Jim, it's not only depressing about how far left they are, but how little they actually understand. There aren't that many questions in this survey, uh, and so they show the the number of millennials and Gen Z that agree with the statement, as well as the total, meaning obviously voters from all different age groups. Okay, so government should provide universal health care. 73.2% of millennials and Gen Z believe that the government should provide universal health care. However, 78.9% of millennials and Gen Z also think the government should allow private insurance. Not only that... They say that uh, 49.6% of millennials and Gen Z prefer living in a socialist country, yet 67.1% say that high earnings are a result of free enterprise. Now, maybe they think that's a bad thing if you have high earnings, but uh, the healthcare one really has me scratching my head here, Jim. So just how poorly is our uh, education system preparing people to be adults here? You know, Greg, it's times like this I am reminded of the wise and astute dare I say, even probing question offered by former President George W. Bush, is our children learning? <laughs> and I think, Ray, we can now say the answer is no. <laughs> Besides making fun of George W. Bush for that uh, verbal syntax error, I've had this nagging question. Like people say, oh my God, the young people are turning socialist. And I really wonder how many have really thought through, and, and if you asked them, what is socialism? Greg, my sneaking suspicion is that a significant chunk would say, well, I'm a socialist because I'm on social media a lot. <laughs> and I'm not a capitalist because I've, I've always really enjoyed E.E. E. Cummings and Bell Hooks. <laughs> and uh, I've just, I, I had, my English papers kept getting, you know, frustration for, you know, all the capital letters and stuff. So um, I never remember the state capitals either. Like, <laughs> if I can think about it, you think about central planning, capitalism probably makes you think decisions are made in the capital <laughs> as opposed to capital referring to money. So how much of this genuinely refers to just genuine confusion of not knowing what these things are? And when people say, oh, you know, we live like Norway. Well, okay, I've been to Norway. It's a nice enough country. Oh, by the way, they have a ton of oil wealth, which helps finance all this kind of stuff. If you happen to, you know, hit, if you hit a gold mine, if you hit, you know, an extraordinarily valuable resource and you have so much of it, that you, yes, all of a sudden it becomes easier to pay for these kinds of programs. Then on the other hand, you go to Norway, there's, there's still stores, there's still rich people, there's still uh, uh, different, you know, whether or not they think of themselves as a classless society, um, they definitely have people who are wealthier than others. Uh, they also have extremely high tax rates, which make people feel like they have a harder time getting ahead. So, you know, first of all, if you really think Norway is the best uh, way of system, one, one thing is to just, you know, try to move there. Oh, that's right. They have really tough immigration rules. Oh, well, that's a little asterisk you never hear about very often. <laughs> um, but that second thing is, is like, you know, well, talk to Norwegians about it. See how they like about it. Uh, I'm sure there are some parts they like, some parts they don't like. My colleague Kevin Williamson is fond of pointing out how many European countries have something akin to a hybrid system on, on health insurance, where, you know, sure, the government pays for your health insurance, some things and other things, and a lot of people have a private insurance for procedures and treatments and things like that that aren't covered by the government. Things like that. Um, but just kind of in general, my, my sneaking suspicion is they don't know much about this. So here's the thing. I, I was having this conversation with my family, and in fact, at the bus stop, this has now turned into the biggest thing. I, I don't want to brag about myself as a father, Greg, but I'll just point out, 
I felt a need to explain to my children what communism was, what socialism was, what uh, the so what made the Soviet Union bad, and what made so many people want to get out uh, until the Berlin Wall came down. And um, Greg, I, I had to turn back to a very wise philosopher, um, someone who really illustrated the absurdities and problems of the Soviet system. He uh, was a Russian, obviously, and then he uh, he got out. Um, and you're probably thinking I'm, I'm discussing Stolichian or somebody like that. No, no. Yakov Smirnov, Greg. <laughs> what a country. Because in America, you watch television. In Russia, the television watches you. <laughs> in, in America, you go to the library to check out a book. In Russia, the library checks you out. I was discussing this, going back to, to college years. I met someone who was uh, born in Russia, had emigrated when they were a child. And uh, I, I didn't know much about that. And I felt a need to, because I, I wanted to impress this girl. Uh, I wanted to show off that I knew things about Russia. So I went out and bought Yakov Smirnov's book in the humor section to give you a sense of the studiousness and appreciation of history that <laughs> young Jim had. But on the other hand, like all of Yakov Smirnov's jokes are about, oh, what a country. I love America. I came from a hellhole. <laughs> I was not free to do anything I wanted. If I did anything bad, they would throw me into jail. Now talk to our artist in National Review, Rowan Yen. That's what happened to him, right? He drew pictures that the estate did not like, and they threw him into jail, right? That's what's so, – there's always this idea of there's this happy theoretical socialism that will work somewhere that's totally nice. Totally, and every time you get into that, look, that's not true socialism. You want to ask these people, okay, if your system is so great, why is it every time it gets tried, somebody louses it up and ends up with secret police and gulags? You keep telling me that's not an, a key ingredient of it, but you always end up with, you know, it, it's kind of like, um, uh, you know, this, this inevitable side effect. It's like, no, no, this time we can put together the baking powder and the vinegar and it won't turn into a volcano that explodes. <laughs> I have a feeling that at some point this socialism just brings people in that direction because the idea is everybody's, you need a collective mentality, which, oh, by the way, is another reason why probably having an entire country of Norwegian, of Norway, there, everybody's been, uh, I don't want to say isolated, like less interaction with foreign countries than some other parts of the world. It's not a Singapore for perspective, okay? It's not a Venice. It's not a, a great trading hub that's always been the centerpiece. Where you have a whole bunch of people who've always had this idea of, oh, we're all in this together. Well, lo and behold, socialism works very well. When you have a very diverse, polyglot, uh, multicultural place where people come from all kinds of different cultures and places and, and faith traditions and, and all kinds of things, all of a sudden it gets harder for people to all believe they're all in this together. And when you try to force this from up on high, it does not work out very well. So anyway, that's my, my soapbox. But again, it's that I, I feel like if you want, you know, so I, the reason I mentioned all this is that for the last couple of days at the bus stop for the school bus, Yakov Smirnov jokes have made a huge comeback amongst the Authenticity Woods uh, elementary school crowd. So there you go. I, I have gotten, I have done my part to spread anti-communism here in Northern Virginia. Yakov Smirnov is a very underrated factor in the uh, downfall of the Soviet Union because uh, he helped to expose the Iron Curtain. I mean, obviously, the biggest moment uh, in the fall of uh, Soviet communism was when Rocky defeated Drago and then explained how that was better than 20 million people dying. That was really the tipping point in the Cold War. But uh, Yakov Smirnov, also a critical factor. Yeah, and I go, I, I'm, I'm saying this, a, you know, a little bit tongue in cheek, but honestly, to get Yakov Smirnov's jokes, like, like, I, you, if you were a diehard believer that communism was a terrific thing, of course you hated Yakov Smirnov, and the Yakov Smirnov, I, you know, I, I saw him, I do a show years and years ago, um, still trying to impress that same young woman from Russia, and uh, the the general gist there is this. Whatever you've heard about communism, it's terrible. <laughs> you know, I hated that place. I had to get out of there. You'd hate it too. You guys are so lucky to live in this. No wonder, you know, conservatives love this, right? No wonder Americans right. love this. No, there was uh, a whether he's doing his cameos on Night Court or he, he was a fairly ubiquitous Tonight Show. Uh, he was a fairly ubiquitous uh, comedian in in the 1980s, and it was this. I believe Reagan invited him to perform at the White House. And no wonder, because you know, it was basically a message of, hey, the system you've been telling you it's so great for everybody, it stinks for almost everybody. Don't try it. So, Greg, we need more Yakov Smirnov. <laughs> Actually, we, what we really need is some sort of like young Venezuelan comic or something like that to come over here and say, hey, I tried this. It's not working out too well. Good point. Good point. But I also noticed the evolution of how – young adults or even adolescents try to impress uh, members of the opposite sex. You're trying to do it with uh, an exposition of Soviet communism and all the, the problems with it. Within about 10 to 15 years, 
guys were trying to impress girls by worrying about the World Bank. And now they're just, you know, uh, hugging the planet and all sorts of other things. So it's definitely gone far left in terms of how the young people try to impress each other. Yeah, I, I got to point out, though, Greg, I'm not going to hold up my entire record of uh, being <laughs> sterling. <laughs> let's, 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 let's tap the brakes on that one. I don't know <laughs> but if you want to say, did it work with that particular young woman? Yes, yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, Jim, have a great day. We'll do it again tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks so much for being with us today and tune in again on Tuesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.